Welcome to NFT Sundays, a weekly conversation around art and technology, brought to you by Dementi and the Museum of Crypto Art. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of NFT Sundays. I am Colborn Bell of the Museum of Crypto Art. A big thank you to Dementi. Uh, and I am here today with the lovely Daisy Alioto of Dirt Substack. Uh, thank you so much for having us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. Super. Um, would you be so kind as to uh, tell us a bit about yourself and how your NFT journey came to be? Yeah, definitely. So I've worked in media pretty much since I graduated from college. My first big sort of media role was as an intern at NPR. Um, and I've since worked in audience development for a bunch of different types of media companies, ranging from Condé Nast publications to New York Magazine, um, to startups like Airmail and First Look Media. So I've really seen a lot of evolutions in the media landscape in terms of in terms of like revenue models, but also the way that platforms that we would consider sort of Web two platforms like Twitter and Facebook have disrupted, impacted, affected the way that media companies distribute their content and also individual content creators as well. Um, and so that's the perspective that I am bringing to Dirt as a sort of nascent Web3 media company. Kyle Cheka, my co-founder and I, had always talked about starting a culture newsletter because there's a lot of really interesting writing about digital culture and the internet that wasn't being um, picked up by mainstream publications. And if it was picked up, it didn't it didn't pay well um, mm. to be a sort of a smart cultural critic and, and to be a little bit like weird in your thinking. But that's the type of writing that we like to do. That's the type of writing that we like to read. And so we figured, okay, we'll, we'll build this home for it with this sub stack, which was going to be essentially a side project for him and I. And then in, this was December, 2020. In spring of 2021, he came to me and said, you know, I've been in touch with this platform, Mirror. They are launching these uh, NFT editions. And I think that we could, um, you know, raise funding for Dirt with it. And then, you know, we we will reinvest this into hiring contributors for Dirt and paying them a really great rate, like more than they would be able to get paid writing for other websites. So we do this first edition sale. We sell them all out. And in the process, I'm sort of learning and he's learning, okay, how does this world of NFTs work? Um, and Kyle's also written about NFTs for The New Yorker. So he was one of the first mainstream writers to talk about Board Ape Yacht Club, to talk about DAOs. And so it's, it's sort of this meta experience where Dirt is writing and covering these topics, but we're also, at the same time, we're sort of integrating them into the business model. Mm. And as time went on, we've done more NFT sales. Um, we have about 160 wallets that are in the Dirt ecosystem now as NFT and token holders and members of the Dirt DAO. And each of those wallets has basically given us the equivalent of on average $500, which is in less than a year, which is way more than you could charge for a subscription for a new publication. I mean, there are publications that are more B2B that are able to charge these types of rates, but it's more like, um, like the information or Bloomberg. So yeah. I think we realized pretty early on that there was an opportunity in Web3 and especially me coming from this audience development background where I've seen the sort of pivot to video and a lot of media publications sort of chasing shifts in the algorithm um, that the thing that was going to make media and Web3 scalable was the fact that these editorial products and the e-commerce on the blockchain, the NFT ownership can really be developed in parallel and hand in hand, right? So if you could go back in time and to like a GQ magazine and say, hey, like you have this great editorial product, but you know, by 2022, it's not going to be scalable. It's going to be a loss leader for Condé Nast. Um, you should start selling products now as part of your whole kind of community proposition, your readership and get people to accustomed to supporting you in this way, then I think media would have taken a very different track. Um, it didn't, you know, nobody knew these changes were coming. Nobody knew these platforms were coming. So knowing what we know now and seeing what we have in these very early 
Web3 technologies, how could these technologies be adapted to be part of a media model that would allow, allow us to create more value in the subscriber relationship, the relationship between the reader and the publication. And because there's such a low overhead on bringing an NFT to market, it's not like mm. making a hat or a tote bag. Um, and there's more of a, I think, a sense of ownership around being able to display them online. We have been able to create more value in that relationship for both the publication um, and the the reader themselves, because there's actually pathways for them to give real governance input into what they want to see in the newsletter and to have a sense of ownership or to be a super collector or super fan rather than just paying a set rate a year to access the editorial product. We really created a community around it. It's a whole universe. We call it the dirty verse. And within that dirty verse, there's all these different roles that you can play, right? Like, so you could be a free subscriber or you could be a paid subscriber or you could be an NFT collector or you could be an investor by holding the tokens. Um, and that's just not been possible with the technology up until this point. Or if it's been technically possible, people haven't taken advantage of that opportunity up until now. And because Kyle and I are like real storytellers, we believe it's inevitable. Somebody's going to try to build a media company like this. We're like, it should be people that are really good writers already and whose friends are writers and have kind of lived through this really terrible period in media where they're getting paid like $50 an article for stuff that takes months to write or weeks to write or even you know a couple hours to write it's a way of really rewarding creators for creating interesting content and and for their fans to be rewarded for engaging with it i will say i think everything that you have said is spot on right and yeah. i think uh we're gonna make this kind of like a choose your own adventure talk because i see mm -hmm. two broad camps here uh yeah. i am super hungry interested in getting into the economics um, and diving deep there. But I think there's also a cultural conversation that we need mm -hmm. to have as well. Uh, so where would you like to start? Well, I mean, maybe this is a cop out, but I think that the economic conversation, the cultural conversation are not entirely different, right? Like certainly not. I am a first time founder. So this is my first experience with actually going out and talking to investors as we've been doing, um, I'm, and I'm not a technical person. So the the reason why I've sort of learned so much about NFTs and the technical aspects of it, which I won't claim to understand all of it, is because of the cultural relevance of it um, and the cultural relevance and the economic relevance, which is that like you can have really talented people, writers, thinkers on the internet, but if they can't pay their bills, um, then that's a problem, right? There's the pathways to distributing content through like a Substack or a Patreon or, you know, a TikTok. They, the platforms and the distribution mechanisms have increased, right? But yeah. the amount of money that flows to the creator has stayed pretty static, right? It's sort of like a cost of living thing, right? Where, oh. yeah, maybe we're making more, we're distributing more, our audience is bigger, but what is the real, you know, value that's trickling to the creator? You know, not that. Not that much. So this is this is very important in a realization that I've had lately is that in my mind, NFTs are really about ownership, right? Mm -hmm. And there is a mm -hmm. lack of ownership uh, in, in this economy, right? Generally, mm -hmm. people chase hype and the way they do it is by going into debt and kind of hoping to resale it on other platforms. So it's almost like liquid ownership. And in that ownership, mm -hmm. you feel a sense of community and common culture uh bounded by kind of like the economics of of wanting it to rise of like imbuing your beliefs into these objects um sharing them with others and then feeling that like collective ownership around i guess the idea of community um and then you know comparing it to kind of you know what uber or airbnb does where you are a subcontractor of the company uh that is certainly like a very different model and i think this is reactionary to some of those more like venture capital models in which generally most of the value is being extracted from the person that is really doing the work yeah absolutely and i also think kyle and i both have a background in art and like writing about art so there are a lot of parallels with 
the art community um, with this, like, you know, artists that died in poverty and then, you know, the price of their paintings go up and the resale value goes up, you know, their foundation maybe never sees that money or they're still living and collectors who, you know, maybe they traded their work with for free rent really early in their career. Um, you know, there's no, there's no resource sale royalty attached to that artwork that's now going for millions of dollars and is not trickling back to the artists, you know, in, in their later life. So there's a lot of parallels in the art world between that and what, what's been happening with writers, not so much that their work is resold. There's no real economy for that, but the, the value of that work is is captured by the platform as the middleman. Like if, if all of us stopped tweeting and posting our work on Twitter, there would be no value to Twitter, right? But we're not considered, we're not stakeholders, right? We're not equity holders in Twitter, uh, but we're, we're creating the majority of the value. So, you know, that's not, that's obviously not fair. We need to have a paradigm shift. I think there's a lot of conversation around skeuomorphism and like mm. not recreating stuff that's familiar in web two and web three. I'm sort of of multiple minds about that. I think we're maybe in like web 2.5. And the reason for that is I don't think that we have to throw out this idea of the subscriber relationship. Like there is a certain camp that's in favor of complete decentralization. And they're more interested in building infrastructure and protocols for like anyone to be a publication. So the dirt blueprint, which is essentially like a media product with a subscription, uh, you know, taking people who are subscribers and turning them into consumers of NFTs and turning consumers into investors, holders of the tokens and participants in the DAO, this like blueprint. There are people who want to build the technology to support that blueprint, um, but they haven't plugged in the talent yet, right? They're just saying like anyone can do this. Personally, I don't think anyone can create a great publication, right? And like some of the conversations that we've had that are like a little bit more frustrating for me are like, well, why don't you guys just go out and sell 10,000 NFTs? And to me, I'm like, dude, like that would be easy. Like selling 10,000 NFTs on hype would be easy. What's really hard is creating an excellent newsletter and sending it out Monday through Friday. Like yeah. your question to people who are saying that they're going to be really like the next great media company and NFTs should not be, can, can you sell out 10,000 NFTs? Like that's whatever. There's a lot of ways to do that and not all of them are ethical. But it's can you create a consistently great media product that's going to keep people in your community and actually capture their attention and capture their attention more than around financial speculation? That is the hard part. But, you know, like that is only a selling point if people already share your values. And some people do and some people don't. Like I found investors who they're like, yes, yes, yes. It's all about the culture. It's all about retention. And others who are like really... Um, no, like hype is and speculation. Like these are these are things that we are going to use as important signifiers. But I think that we're going through this period in NFTs. I would say like a period of maturation. Yeah. Where there's projects where it's like, you know, this term like there's no there there, right? Like there's just it's sold out. Like all these people are there. They're they're holding it. The floor is high. But like, what now? Oh, well, we'll pivot to being a media company. Dirt we started with the media product first and we're building the NFT universe on top of that. And to me, like that is the trajectory I'm comfortable with. Cause that's the trajectory that like my experience, my very rich experience in media and Kyle's very rich experience as a writer has led us up to. Yeah. I mean, just in contrast, I'll take the, the low hanging fruit here uh, of, of board ape yacht club who has like been very successful and growing, 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 scaling into affinity on the back of just like some monkey JPEG. <laughs> um, to to the point of a, it's a five billion dollar valuation in less than a year, yeah. right? And then it, I don't own any, so I have no financial interest in this. Yeah. There is a limit to the amount of free stuff you can continue to give, or there is a limit to the amount of like like streetwear you can drop and what is like the buzz of that hype for me that only seems down and you see it again and again with all of these pfp projects once the hype is gone there is no way to recover it for me it's very similar to 2017 ico boom you know mm -hmm. you pump it you dump it and it's over um mm -hmm. so i applaud and respect what you are doing because i think you're right 
I think you're right. It is much more difficult to create something that people will be interested, engage with, tell their friends about, derive like real value from and want to be a part of as opposed to selling it all up front on the expectation of promises and then trying to sustain momentum by giving away more and more and more until it just uh, finds the bottom and everybody is left kind of, well, holding the bag. Um, For sure. And I think I've learned a lot from Board Ape Yacht Club um, just in the way that they operate and then them as like almost like a very public experiment and like how many different sort of pathways can we add into this original community um, and watching them sort of in innovate away from the PFP model. Uh, but the thing that I think Dirt has and needs to be developed more just not in Dirt, but like other brands is the ability to reach people who are skeptics of Web3 and haven't seen mm. themselves reflected in um, the landscape up until this point. So one of our advisors sort of joked that we're like the hipster board at Yacht Club. Um, yeah. But if you look at the people who have our NFTs, 34% made their first blockchain transaction with us. Um, and 23% of the DAO only belong to our DAO. So that means like for 34%, we were their first entry point into NFTs and 23%, we were their first entry point into holding a token and participating in a DAO. Um, and that's really powerful. And a lot of people have said to us, like people who are really interesting creators, influential people um, on the internet have said like point blank, I really don't like NFTs. I don't believe in Web3, but Dirt is the one thing that sort of redeemed this space, given me pause and made me curious about the technology. And it's like, wow, if we could be the exception for somebody to say, I can't dismiss this completely because I love this newsletter a lot and I've seen what they're doing and, it, and it's actually really interesting and works, then that's such a powerful position to be in. And I, I really don't take it lightly because I don't think our role is to really be evangelists of the technology. I think our role is to create a model for a more sustainable media ecosystem that might work mm. for some publications, not all publications, but some publications, one. And two, to, to carry forward the message that we write about digital culture and NFTs are part of digital culture and they're here to stay. And if we are able to learn about them, then we can make sure that the technology bends in an arc that reflects our values and our ideology. If we refuse to engage with it, then you're leaving the technology for sort of the worst actors to apply. Um, and I think when a technology is inevitable, it's really important to have at least a baseline understanding of it so that you can invest your attention towards people who are using that technology in an interesting, ethical and engaging way. I mean, this is a, for this is a vibe for me, right? Like, mm -hmm. for me, the models really speak to like the heart of New York versus the heart of Hollywood, right? And mm -hmm. I think people in New York work; they just like mm -hmm. work for it. And we see the way that um, culture is born of depth and intent. You lived in Brooklyn; you see kind of like the micro communities that form mm -hmm. and how that gets exported all over the world. Uh, Hollywood is is of course obviously about painting the fantasy. Uh, without mm -hmm. like the underlying perhaps like depth and trying to sell the fantasy and the illusion really without doing, in my opinion, the work. Um, yeah. You know, one trend in the media industry that w I didn't talk about before, you know, I mentioned the pivot to video, but there's also this long term trend of intellectual property being more valuable than the original creation. So mm -hmm. like you could write a story for a magazine, maybe sell it to the magazine for $2,000, say it's like, a really sort of crazy celebrity scandal story for Vanity Fair. And like, you're just like hoping and praying Netflix buys the rights to this because that $2,000 is going to be gone in a month, right? Yeah. Once you pay your rent. Um, but it's the intellectual property that's actually valuable. And that's the sort of, that's like the Hollywood money, right? And this intellectual property being more valuable than the origin thing um, is this trend that I think continues into NFTs, right? Where we have the secondary market sort of being more important than the primary market. Uh, and how do we take advantage of that and like recapture some of that value? But like you're saying, I think that there's certain projects where they've sort of gone over the front wheel of the bicycle by overvaluing the IP, the secondary over the primary thing. So there's all these people that own the rights to their apes. So like, great, you own the intellectual property that sounds really valuable on its face, right? Um, 
but if you own 70 apes and you want to make a tv show with them what's the tv show right like who are the fans why are they going to care about it like what's the story like that ip is not enough um but maybe the ip would be enough in a game or whatever but like you have to have the context and the cultural acuity and the background in media to actually then find that product market fit for the story you know everyone talks about product market fit from a financial perspective fine like you know if you sell to ten thousand people then you're able to say i found my product market fit because i sold out the nft well what's the ip market fit like are you really yeah. like do you really have the knowledge and the experience to then place this ip into the platform that it needs to be in and and write the story around it i think some people do and like some people don't and 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 people who are coming from purely a technology background like god bless them i don't know that they necessarily have the ability to predict who's going to be winners and losers when it comes to brand building and storytelling because it's not their world um and luckily like there are more people from this world moving in and kyle and i are moving some of them in like through dirt but mm -hmm. You know, it's crazy because most of the people who would do the best job with figuring out what is going to be the 70 ape story are like really like comparatively like pretty poor and like coming out of a world where they've never been rewarded for these skill sets. And right. there's other people coming in with like false confidence of what they can do because they quit their job at Google and they live in like a penthouse in San Francisco. Totally. So if Web3 is like not going to repeat the mistakes of Web2, then there has to be a pathway for people to come in with these real skill sets and not just let, you know, people coming out of tech, just like sort of shuffle the cards around. Um, Cause you know, it's like, we have to be able to comfortable saying like the emperor has no clothes or like, you don't know what you're doing or like your newsletter sucks or like this movie sucks. Like nobody's going to watch this. Like yeah. if you can't say that you're not a cultural critic. <laughs> totally. I mean, look, and I think what you're getting at the heart of is like, what is Madonna going to do with her ape? What is Justin yeah. Bieber going to do with their ape when you are like diluting value to celebrity and trying to draw like public attention in that way, you are losing the people that will build the project, which is yeah. why, in my opinion, like I still have a tremendous amount of faith in the crypto punks community because most people who acquired those in the very beginning for very early prices were literally the builders of the space. Yeah. They're Ethereum devs, they're Ethereum programmers, they're thinking on the next big thing. Um, and they love that IP because it speaks to very much, in my opinion, like the counterculture that Punks was. So yeah. now it's very interesting that Yuga Labs has both. Um, and we'll begin to, I guess, see how, you know, they integrate. Uh, it's, it is, it's just very, very fascinating to me. Yeah. And I think the internet, like the pace of the internet, we're already seeing this where the counterculture becomes mainstream culture, like integrated so quickly, right? That, that yeah. cycle has been foreshortened. And one of my favorite dirt pieces that we wrote is like, it's, it's, it's it was kind of departure from what dirt usually does, but it's the story that um, I wanted to share of this guy, Bob, who was a lead singer for a band called the shirts that was, um, you know, an early CBGB act. They performed with the talking heads. I met him because he was selling a painting on the street. I bought the painting from him, um, learned more about him and started interviewing him about his life. Um, and his story is like really the story of who in each counterculture movement wins and loses, right? And like financially, if you're coming out of the counterculture, the, the way to sort of win or to be able to create a long-term career is to allow yourself to be subsumed a little bit into the mainstream culture, right? Like there's no counterculture story that's a success story that doesn't include mainstream success in some way. That's just the way that it works. Um, and so yeah. I love telling his story and, and the version that I told in Dirt was a little bit shorter and it was told through um, Google Maps. So the fact that like his old studio space looking at it on google maps he had put the sign up for that studio that he saved with, that shared with david byrne uh, up in cardboard and the usps had eventually acknowledged it as the real address and put up a permanent sign so he had that on google maps i had his gallery on google maps which is just like this portion of the sidewalk where he sells his painting and so what made it a dirt story was hey like this band the shirts is like totally underrated nobody knows about them they like you know their lead singer, Annie, like went on to be in the, the movie Hairspray, but like she got mainstream success. These guys didn't. They were just dudes from Brooklyn and 
we, and, and I told the story through Google Maps. So that was super fun. It was one of my favorites, but it's like, this is the example I think that I go back to when somebody says like counterculture, counterculture, like what is the counterculture of NFTs? Cause like ultimately it's everything will be subsumed. It's just sort yeah. of like controlling how much of that character can be retained. Um, can people really remain on the fringe and still have financial stability? Um, yeah. Maybe, maybe not. Um, something that you said reminded me of um, Brud, the brand Brud. And there, I think a lot of people that are involved in Brud are now involved with FWB um, and Dapper Collectives. They have a really interesting thesis around um, sort of who can create a media company and who can create a Web3 community around a media product. Um, one of their sort of products, sounds weird to say that, but like media, I don't know, uh, they had a whole media world around Michaela, the robot, right? Of course. Um, yeah. And like, I think that Michaela's really cool and really legit, but like the 50th Michaela, not that interesting, right? And so I think even within these success stories, they include this cautionary tale of like being the first and being the original is really important. Like the 50th, you know, derivative project based on apes, it's all diminishing returns, right? Like totally. when somebody goes to a museum and they see, uh picasso and they're like my kid could do that it's like first of all your kid didn't second of all your kid didn't do it first so taking some of what we know from like traditional art and like the value of being first and being an original and realizing that like derivatives will have a diminishing return financially they'll have a diminishing return culturally i think should be part of this maturation period in nfts where people are saying like okay, it's time to plug the content and it's time to plug the talent in like we've talked our big talk about what media is going to look like Who's going to actually make it? Is it going to be good? And like dirt is right there to sort of like scoop up that conversation and say like, hey, yeah, we're here. We're like really good writers. We write for the New York Times and we write for GQ and we're bringing our talents to Web3 and we're bringing our friends along with us. And I'm really excited to be in that position. And uh, this is this is like going to be a tough question, but uh, and it speaks to, I think, the point on how do we appropriately like shepherds you know, good things more into the mainstream so people can kind of yeah. derive more of that value. Um, but my understanding uh, is that Brood and Friends with Benefits is now very largely Andreessen Horowitz backed. Mm. Um, so when, you know, like Jack at Twitter is calling out Andreessen for controlling all of Web3. Mm. Uh, and when, again, we are just like accruing value to venture capitalists, Ultimately, I think we're doing, like you said, perhaps ourselves a service uh, of Web 2.5 and not mm -hmm. like Web 3.0, where the original creators of that value continue to be like rewarded and remunerated for the work that they do. Um, so that is that makes me very nervous because we live in a world that is awash in capital, right? There is more capital than there is talent, ideas, value and work. And like you, like you said earlier, it's very easy to sell up front because there is so much capital. Um, yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. And like being in the position of looking at like, hey, do we take some investment now or do we do a big community raise? I think what's moved us towards taking strategic investment is like, we want our community to be the cultural capital. We don't want them to have to be like the financial runway for right. dirt to go out and do our next sale we want to have enough capital on hand to really do it right and make sure we're serving people and reaching people who aren't already in the space. If we did a 10,000 NFT project tomorrow and we sold out, our community would be limited to people that are already in web three. I see our community as people who haven't bought their first NFT yet. And, cool. you know, I can see how that would seem like a cop out, but like, if you talk about an underserved audience, it's people who aren't in the space yet. And how do you reach those people? I think, you, you can't fundraise from the people that are already here and then say our community is like beyond that. You're sort of locking yourself into what Web3 is in this moment. So I'm very interested in taking strategic capital to go out and build dirt enough to bring in more people who I think will benefit from being in the space and can benefit the space by nature of being here. Um, and also just to establish dirt as not uh, a media company covering Web3 but a web three media company and that the technology is endemic to what we do, but not everything that we write about has to do with crypto. It's about 
digital culture at large. And I think that that's what's made it so appealing. I would say the breakdown now is like 25, 75 crypto, yeah. non-crypto topics. And that works really well for us. And it works really well for the people that aren't sure if they're interested in, in talking about anything related to crypto yet. Because they just, you know, they tune that stuff out and they get to enjoy the rest of it. But over time, you know, it, it this there's this understanding that like, this is what digital culture is now. And, and there are threads of relevance going between the stuff that you care about and the stuff that you're not sure if you care about yet. And if you want to follow those threads, we can lead you, we can lead you down them. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. Like the, taking capital is um, not something that I take lightly. I also think there's a little bit of this perspective that um, there are a lot of people going out and they're raising capital based on vibes, right? Like sure. everything that we've <laughs> talked about, like there are people who are saying we're going to build the next Web3 media company and raising right now. And like if those people have $6 million and you have $500,000 from your community, like you you are a little bit forced into a competition with people who don't know what they're doing. And I would rather for the people who build it to be people that know that world, which is like Kyle and I. And I think yeah. that that's another reason why we felt like taking strategic capital is the right thing to do because it allows us to be in a position to not be out sort of outbid or out built by somebody who genuinely doesn't know what they're doing, but is going to capture a lot of attention on the sort of false promise that they do. I'm a, I'm a critic, right? And I think what yeah. you do is absolutely the best in the space. And there are like a lot of people trying uh, but for me, the way that they generally try is very like BuzzFeed, clickbait, feed mm -hmm. people misinformation, feed people uh, the next thing to hype into. All of these people are going to get wrecked and there will be no repercussions to the people that provided that information. Yeah. Right. So I really like applaud what you're doing, um, because for me, what I see is a lot of the same money just going through the spin cycle. Mm -hmm. Like we are not pulling in new collectors. There is a reason that art sales are off a cliff. There is a reason that NFT sales are off a cliff because uh, the, the bubble has burst, in my opinion. Um, and, you know, because of like the speed, the hype of the Internet, of crypto, uh, a lot of people are going to get hurt by this. Mm -hmm. So to do something long term, more sustainable, sustainably, make sure you have the runway, uh, I think is really important. So I just. Yeah, uh, I think like uh, what you're describing and what I'm describing is taste, right? This whole concept of taste, like they had the NFT summer, there was like DeFi summer. And now like the next period is going to be the period that injects a little bit of taste into uh, yeah. this world. Um, and like and, and that can feel like um that can feel like you said like kind of falling off the financial cliff but it's also like a it's a correction right it's necessity um i won't buy something that i don't like i have a couple nfts that i own that i'm like uh, i don't even like this artwork um but i really try not to get caught up in stuff like that like yeah. and and sometimes it's stuff that's like really popular like world of women you know really like i'm happy for them they're the most prominent female project um, I don't like the art. I'll never buy one. I don't care if it's worth a million dollars. I just don't like it. And, and so that's, it's important to be able to say that too, and yeah. to not just be like a follower and um, to develop your own taste. And it makes the conversation around stuff richer. Like we ran a piece that was about Martha Stewart's NFT project. And it was from the perspective of this writer, Anna Perling, basically saying like, I was a huge fan of Martha Stewart magazine. This is what I love about Martha Stewart. This is how it feels to read the magazine. Does her NFT live up to the feeling that the watching Martha Stewart or reading her magazine gave me? Um, that's like such an important premise for criticism. And like, it's right. such a great, rich combination between criticism and personal essay, which is like dirt's bread and butter. Like we need way more writing about that. Yeah. And, and some people just can't distinguish between the value of that and like, 500 words on the who, what, where, when, why of when something's going to drop. Um, you know, each of them can have their own audience, but over the long term, I think people want to read stuff that's like more curated and contextualized because it helps them develop their own taste. And then if there's an opportunity to become a token holder in that project and actually participate in votes that will allow their taste to then be reflected in dirt, 
is like huge. Like yesterday I asked the Dow um, or maybe a couple of days ago, like we have another vote coming up. Um, we had a, a an article commission that fell through. And so I said, hey, like we're gonna do another mini vote to replace that article and we'll collect some ideas. What are you guys interested in reading about right now? I'll go out and try to find a writer to pitch it. Um, and somebody said righteous gemstones. And then somebody else said that they're hist- interested in the history of roguelikes, which is a, a uh, a type of video game like that developed really early and sort of mimics some aspects of like RPGs, like tabletop oh. RPGs. Yeah. These two like very like you know seemingly random topics that both fall under this umbrella of digital culture. Within 24 hours, I found a writer to write Righteous Gemstones, who's from the South and and grew up like within minutes from where it was filmed and bring mm. a higher experience of the South and this Christian culture reflected in the show to this essay. And I found somebody who's an expert in RPGs to write about roguelikes. And it's because like, we already have this like network of storytellers, right? And so to be in a DAO and be able to say like, wake up one day and be like, hmm, I really like to read about this thing. And to have the the ability within that community for that to then just happen, like it doesn't even have to be through a blockchain vote. It can just be like, hey, like, I'm just going to throw this idea into discord and and to be able to like act on that within 24 hours, because you know, enough people that have that expertise and can write well about it. Like when has a New York Times subscriber been able to have that sort of power impact or an ear, you know, the editor's ear in that way? I just, I just don't think it's been possible. Um, you know, and, and I would love to keep some of this as we also scale. Yep. Um, and get bigger, but I'm really like proud that we're able to offer that type of experience and community to people. I mean, that is just a very weight, uh, native web three experience, yeah. right? Because it's, uh, instead of, you know, somebody going to their editor, ping ponging stories back and forth for weeks, right? It's just the speed and it's the responsiveness yeah. to culture in the moment is the ability for whoever it is, the writer, the artist to, to capture what is happening of the moment and be able to get just like a green light approval, go add that value, go add that value. Um, and that's why we see like so many celebrities scrambling and so many people trying to like represent some sort of project like Martha Stewart. You know, I was speaking to well, I was in LA last week, so I was speaking to a lot of these these Hollywood types, and yeah. you know the roadmap for how to sell the thing up front is there and established, but nobody knows what the next step is, right? Right. And, like, what is and the thing? <laughs> what is the thing? And the next thing everybody is talking about is is metaverse experience, mm-hmm. but nobody is lacking. Nobody wants to be on the computer more. Like we've. <laughs> We, yeah. you know, we've, we've been trapped like inside for a couple of years now. Like I'm not interested in wandering through ex celebrities metaverse experience or like the worst of which was JP Morgan's bank. Um, you know, like why, why it's so hollow. It's so sterile. There's, there's no life, there's no vibrancy. Uh, and it's just not the community. So it's, just interesting to see everybody else like falling flat scrambling waiting for somebody else to figure out what comes next for them in contrast to you who can like have the idea and spin it around um yeah that was always the cool thing like about our museum is that you know we could have an idea for an exhibition we could get a build up in 24 hours and we could have the art installed the next day and it is just responsive right galleries museums take six months to many years to kind of schedule out and plan we're operating at a different scale we're operating at a different speed yeah yeah i think that you can't use technology as a cudgel to change human behavior you have to sort of surf along the organic behaviors that are already happening um, and the fact that people like to use our discord to share things that they want to read about is very natural response to what we've built um if we forced people to like purchase an article as an nft to read it or whatever that would be like swimming against the tides of how people want to engage and so i think yeah i think just because it's lucrative to sort of like front run the way people are behaving at this moment and then trying to use all of that capital to sort of like entice them to behave in a different way. It doesn't mean that it's like right. And it doesn't mean that it's going to work. And I think that that's the problem that Facebook is facing right now. Facebook is such a big ship to try to turn around and for them to like start turning the ship 
by becoming meta and going big on the metaverse before they know if like people even want to go in that direction or what it's going to look like. It's a really big, uh, it's a big swing, right? Like I would rather be a smaller company working on the future of the metaverse right now, because then at least you can be nimble and have the agility to say, you know what, we're too early to this one thing. We're seeing people organically behave this way. They want to go into a concert in the metaverse and then leave. And they only want the concert to last 30 minutes. Great. Like, then you don't have to take the big swing and, 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 you know, maybe fall flat on your face because you're still early. And yeah, yeah, I guess that's like, that's the risk of taking so much capital or reallocating so much capital before you're able to really be in touch with people's desires. Oh gosh, we, we see it all over the world, right? Like multinationals having to like break down and reassess. I think the only way is like modal, like small pockets of in cooperative individuals mm-hmm. that are flexible to each and other's needs. We only have like a couple more minutes. So I kind of want to get into like the practicalities oh, of yeah, how somebody sure. can like buy an NFT of yours and, you know, get involved. Yeah, absolutely. So we have our Substack, dirt.substack.com. Um, I think in the future we'll probably migrate off of Substack, but it's been a it's it was a wonderful platform to launch on. Right now we have around seven thousand subscribers and growing. Um, we have a Discord. Anyone can participate in the Discord. Our NFTs are available on OpenSea. Um, some of them are only available on secondary now. I think most of our additions have stayed pretty much with the people who purchase them and then our tokens up until this point our DAO is sort of in beta so the tokens have been airdropped to the nft holders so there's no market for the token right now you can't go out and buy it on its own um but for the participants in the DAO who have those tokens it's around like 160 people and so Super. in the future later this year we'll be doing a way bigger sale and it'll be another opportunity to get an nft or a token well i will certainly keep an eye out Yeah, Yeah. I'm super interested in what you do. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, Um, thanks for having me. Yeah, any final words? Uh, (laughs) (laughs) No, I mean, I'm really excited about the future of this technology. I've always been something, somebody who's been drawn to stuff early. I think Kyle and I get along really well because we're able to see shifts in the culture before other people do. And part of the reason we had the newsletter is because we would pitch these trend pieces and stories to publications. And they would say like, I don't know, like if this is really a thing. And then six months later, like very much becomes a thing. Everyone's writing about it. And so we, we were always experiencing this curse of being too early. And now I think we finally found a way to apply the ability to our sort of foresight and our understanding of culture and using it to predict trends and human behavior and, and desire and like reading patterns and cultural you know, behaviors and incentives. And we've actually found a way to apply that by using this technology to supercharge this newsletter that we already had. And so um, maybe Kyle and I have finally found a like product market fit for our talents. (laughs) I love it. You're the best. Super enjoyed the conversation. Uh, And I'm Colborn Bell. We'll sign off here. NFT Sundays. Breaking news. 